All right. For rational inequalities, the idea is a lot like polynomial inequalities. And if you remember on polynomial inequalities, what we were dealing with was, the idea was that we're trying to find out when the polynomial is above the x-axis and when is it below the x-axis. You know, To find out when a polynomial is greater than zero or above the x-axis, or when is the polynomial less than zero? When is it below the x-axis? And the nice part about polynomial inequalities is the only way a polynomial can go from being above to below the x-axis is at a zero. When it touches the x-axis, when it crosses the x-axis. So, to find out, to find when the polynomial is above or below the x-axis, we find out when is it zero. When is it on the x-axis? When is it on the x-axis? Because then, at these points, these points kind of divide it up, and we can test. Well, are you above or below here? In this region, are you above or below? In the third region, are you above and below? And so forth and so on. In each region, is the polynomial above or below? It's going to be the same idea with rational inequalities. But there's a complication. And that is, rational functions can switch from above to below at more than just the places where it touches the x-axis. You know, in the video on, uh, let's see, on rational functions, I looked at something, something like, you know, a rational function, something like this, roughly. And actually, yeah. So, the trouble is, is that rational functions can switch from above to below not only at zeros at where it touches the x-axis but at vertical asymptotes as well so it can go from it can go between above and below x-axis the x-axis at zeros and at vertical asymptotes. So we're going to have to take into account not just when are these things zero, but when are their denominators zero? When are their vertical asymptotes occurring? But we'll play the same game. We'll play the game of once we find out where it can go from above to below, we'll ask in each of those intervals, are you above here or are you below here? So enough talk. Let's start out with looking at an example. So I'm taking this from uh, example seven. on page 39. And they're looking at the inequality x squared plus 2x minus 15 divided by x minus 1. We want to know when is that fraction greater than or equal to 3. So, our first step is going to be get everything on one side. In, a, in essence, we're going to have to go through the harder method of 
solving a rational equation in order to do this, in order to get our solution. And there's a, there's a good reason for that, but if we get to it, I'll talk about it. Otherwise, I'm just going to leave it as a simple do this because I told you so, or you're supposed to. In any case, so we subtract 3 from both sides, and I'm going to want to put this over 1 because our next step is going to be to combine fractions. We're going to have to add fractions or subtract fractions in this case, so we're going to need you know, common denominators or like denominators. So in this case, x minus 1 and 1. The LCD between x minus 1 and 1 is just x minus 1. So I don't need to do anything to the first fraction, to the x squared plus 2x minus 15 over x minus 1. That already has the least common denominator. But I do need to do something to 3 over 1. To make this denominator x minus 1, I'm going to have to multiply top and bottom of this fraction by x minus 1. Because when I multiply by x minus 1 over x minus 1, I'm effectively just multiplying by 1. And multiplying by 1 does nothing. So in effect, I'm not changing this equation at all rather inequality. I'm not changing the inequality at all. I'm just rewriting it to put it in a convenient format. And in this case, convenient means so I can subtract these two fractions. So, now I'm going to simplify so this is x squared plus 2x minus 15 minus 3x minus 3 times minus 1 is plus 3. And this is all over x minus 1. So let's see. We're going to have x squared. 2x minus 3x is going to be minus x. So this is x squared minus x and then we had a 15 and 3 I think that we had to take care of minus 15 plus 3 that is uh, minus 12 and this is divided by our denominator x minus 1 and this is greater than or equal to 0 so, I believe I'm on step three, but I'm just going to double check. Let's see, yep, one, everything on one side, two, common denominators to combine fractions, three, factor, factor, factor. Factor, the numerator, and the denominator. So, let's see, the numerator... Uh, leading coefficient is 1. I'm multiplying that by minus 12, and that gives me minus 12. Factors of minus 12 that add to minus x, or minus 1. Uh, how about minus 4 and 3? As for the denominator, that's as factors as it can get. So the numerator is 1x squared, or just x squared, minus 4x plus 3x minus 12 and what's in common with the first two what's in common with the last two with the first two x is in common so and factoring out x leaves me with x minus 4 in the next pair the last pair 3 is in common and when I factor 3 out I've got x minus 4, which is great, because then that leaves me with x minus 4 in common, 
and I can factor out x minus 4, which leaves me with x plus 3 left over. Now, everything is nice and factored. Now, now what I do, now I set the numerator and denominator equal to zero and solve. Because the numerator equals zero will give me x-intercepts, which is one place where this rational equation, this rational formula, can go from being above to below the x-axis. It can switch from being greater than zero to less than zero, or vice versa. And when the denominator is zero, finding out when that happens, those are vertical asymptotes. And on the left of a vertical asymptote, this thing could be above, and on the right, it could come from below, or vice versa, go from below and then above on the right. So we're finding out when does this thing switch from above, when could it possibly switch from above to below? Just like we did with the polynomials. So I'm gonna have x minus four times x plus three, set that equal to zero, and I'm gonna set x minus one equal to zero. Product of two things being zero, so first thing could be zero, or second thing could be zero, in which case, if the first thing is zero, we could have x equals four. In the second case, we get x equals minus three, and when the denominator is zero, that's only gonna happen when x equals one. So again, you can do this next step as a, a, a table or a number line, but I prefer the, uh, the number line approach. So I'm gonna order things out. What's gonna come first? What's the leftmost point on the number line? Well, it's gonna be minus three. Minus three is the smallest thing, the leftmost thing on the number line. And then minus two, minus one, zero. Next smallest is gonna be something like one, and then lastly we have four, so two, three, and four. So this, these three points are where the graph can go from above to below, or below to above the x-axis. And so we're going to find out. To the left of minus 3, when x is less than minus 3, is this thing above or below? Well, let's find out. Let's try. We can pick anything we want, but be nice to yourself. Pick something like minus 4. Minus 4 is going to be nice to use. Factoring first rather than kind of switching these around and, you know, at this point setting the numerator and denominator equal to zero and solving. Factoring first has the advantage of plug your test points, these trial points, in here. Minus four, minus four times minus four plus three divided by minus four minus one. This is gonna be easy to figure out whether it's positive or negative. Watch this. Minus four minus four is minus eight. Minus four plus three is minus one. Divide that by minus four minus one, which is minus five. Minus eight times minus one divided by a negative five. Remember, all I care about is whether this is positive or negative. We can go through and say minus eight times minus one is a positive eight, and when we divide it by a negative five, we get negative eight uh, fifths. But all we're gonna care about is that this thing is negative. We don't care about the eight fifths. So why go through and compute it? Why not just say I've got a negative times a negative divided by a negative, 
one, two, three negatives are going to make a negative. Why do the computation? We don't care about the actual number. We just care is the number positive or negative. So you can kind of go through and do this shortcut. Let's see. Here we're between minus three and one. So we need a value between minus three and one to test out. Is this above or is this below the x-axis? I could do minus two, minus one, or hey, zero. Zero's, a zero, zero's a, not necessarily fun, because I know college algebra is a massive pain, but zero's easier to evaluate. That's what I meant to say. So let's see. Plug it into the factored form, zero minus four times zero plus three divided by 0 minus 1. And if I play this game of positive or negative, let's see, minus 4 plus 3 over minus 1. That's a negative times a positive over negative. Positives don't do anything. So really, I've just got two negatives, and two negatives are going to make a positive. So that tells us that we are above the x-axis in this region. This thing's above the x-axis here. What about between 1 and 4? Well, we could do 2, 3, or really anything between 1 and 4. You know, 1.11111, whatever the hell you want. But just, for God's sakes, this class is hard enough. Just be nice to yourself. Pick a small number, like 2. Plug it into the factored form, 2 minus 4 times 2 plus 3, divided by 2 minus 1, and we get minus 2 times plus 5, divided by plus 1, so that's negative times positive over positive. Who cares about positives? They're not going to change anything. We've got one negative. One negative is going to put, I should have left myself a little space here, one negative is going to put negatives all in this region. We're below the x-axis. This thing is below the x-axis between 1 and 4. What about when we're larger than 4, when we're to the right of 4? Well, let's try a small number. Let's be nice to ourselves. Let's pick something like 5. 5 minus 4 times uh, 5 plus 3 over 5 minus 1. That is 1 times 8 over 4. That's positive times positive times positive. Uh, positives everywhere. So we get a positive. 6. Decide on positives, negatives, and whether to keep endpoints. And in this case, there are endpoints you will always throw out and points ends with a T, not a D. You never want the denominator to be zero. And the denominator is zero when x equals one. We will never, 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 never include the vertical asymptotes. Never include the places where the denominator is zero. Everything else we can include. We can include minus three and four if the situation calls for it. Minus 3 and 4 are going to make this thing 0. So is it okay to have 0 here? Is it okay to get 0 greater than or equal to 0? Yeah, that's 0 equals 0, and that's okay. So we will take these endpoints, so we will include, now we will put or equal to underneath everything that isn't a vertical asymptote. Now, above or below, we want these things, we want this thing to be greater than zero. Greater than zero is positive. Positive is above. We want the pluses. So our answer is minus three to one, including minus three, but excluding one, or excuse me, x greater than or equal to 4. And I've run out of room here, so I'll kind of jot on this other page here what the interval notation is, because I need to be writing it down so you can learn to read it. But again, you do not need to be writing this down. 
you have a perfectly good notation, namely this notation, to use to write down your answers. We've got other stuff to learn. We don't need to learn a redundant notation.